welcome to Too Much Music. And hi ho, <laughs> hey, what's going on? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. I'm Allison. This is this I'm is Greg. Greg. Yeah, and uh, we're here to talk to you today about musical identity. But first, how about our own identities? Let's let's talk about those. How you doing, Greg? What's going on in your world? I'm doing great. <laughs> I've just uh, undertaken a tremendous uh, studio uh, renovation. So lots of new instruments, new wiring, new, uh, you know, so my studio is in, is in process and that's a very fun thing. Um, it is chilly now. So it's the end of September in the mountains of New England. And so it's like I woke up in the, it was in the thirties. So uh, yeah, I, I love it. It smells great. feels great. It's like perfect outdoor working weather for me. So yeah. yeah and I'm I know happy. you have Very large happy. piles of wood that you're processing personally, which I it's find... The trees that grew on the land will warm my cabin in the winter. <laughs> How poetic is that? How quaint. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah. it's, but it's true and it's kind of beautiful. It is. It's also beautiful to have kiln-dried firewood dumped outside your <laughs> shed. <laughs> and that is where you are. Yeah. Having it hand-delivered, perfectly seasoned, oh, man. stacked, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just look at it and it just lights on fire. It just ignites. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is nice to, to get into the cooler weather a little bit. And um, yeah. I'm uh, personally feeling really peppy and happy today because I stopped my insane coffee experiment. Um, I decided that I was going to try to be without caffeine and see what that was like. Um, How'd that work out for you? Yeah, it sucks. No, I'm, yeah, I'm just, <laughs> it, it I'm sucks. Like, mm, uh, I would say that sucks. the mm. experiment, you know, rendered a very firm result, and it's that you know I probably should have less caffeine. But yeah. not no caffeine. Um, you inspired me to have less, and so yeah, and I think it is better. Yeah, uh, but but there's a rough rough period transition. Boy, it was bad. I did cold turkey for two weeks, and I swear our last two episodes, my eyes were just glazed over. <laughs> I could barely talk. I could barely think. Like trying to read articles, and I just kept reading the same sentence over and over again. Turns out, coffee's important. So let's. It, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, coffee. I had I had a, a, a someone who who watched the podcast come back and say, "Is Allison high?" And I said, "No, absolutely not. It's nine o'clock in the morning. What are you talking about? She just stopped coffee. That's all." Seriously, somebody noticed that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Aww. You looked you looked a little a little out of it. It's okay. I'm sorry, everyone. We, we love you. I'm okay. We love you. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> oh, it was just an experiment. Um, yeah, I'm just. But you on, have an espresso machine too. You have like a one button press espresso machine, so you should use it, dude. Looking at well, that every day for two weeks and not <laughs> turning it on was like torture. <laughs> it was truly oh awful. My God. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, just a lower dose. That's all I needed. Um, and everything's everything's fine now. I'm back. So, okay. Yeah, and I'm glad because we have a really fun topic today that's near and dear to both of our hearts, and we get to do a little bit of geekery. Um, which I know both of us love, and par for the course. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about musical identity. What makes it? What is it? How do you see it? How do you know it? Do you know it when you see we it? We all know it when we see it. We all know <laughs> it. So maybe I can start and just um, you know. So I'm a composer, um, and I spent a lot of years, more than a decade, you know, having mentorships with great composers. Uh, that's what you do, and it's almost always a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, and the the thing that happened in most of those uh, meetings is that there was a lot, and this happened in performance. I'm, I'm a pianist as well, and this happened in my my uh, piano lessons too, which is to say, people would talk about music in these very metaphorical, lofty very uh, intangible terms, right? They would leave the analysis for music theory class, <laughs> so to speak, and want to talk about the music that I was working on and the specifics of it in abstract terms, cause and effect, uh, possibility, um, you know, just sort of floaty cloud type language. Um, 
which is sort of an old school. My, my teachers were from a different generation and uh, it was sort of an old school, maybe romantic approach to performance and musical thinking. Um, Interesting, a romantic has, approach, even though they were hardcore 20th century composers. Yeah, well, but as we know, the 20th century sort of fell into two camps, right? There were some people who wanted to break with the past and wanted to look very hard at just the math sort of thing. Well, not just the math, but a lot put that at the forefront. Mm. And then there were others who wanted to adopt that language or, or you know, be open to those new possibilities that, that the 20th century brought, but, but, but remain in a romantic spirit. And I, I kind of sided with those folks. And who are the, um, um, just so, you know, our listeners will have a more um, specific idea of what you're talking about. Who are the composers you're thinking of? Maybe a couple composers in each camp that people might know. So, Oh, so Pierre Boulez, uh -huh. you know, for Stockhausen. example, he's sort of the, <laughs> yep. Those are folks who are on the, uh, break with the past. We need to start again. Uh, the world has changed. And this happened a lot, largely because of World War II. We can, we're not going to get in the history of this, but after World War II, people did have a major cultural and psychological reset that mm -hmm. they needed to make. And they felt like maybe the, the, um, the excessiveness of pre-war romanticism and expressionism in Europe, especially, may have been part of what led to the atrocities, right? So, um, so they wanted to pull that back and get control over it. And there was also the fact that this was happening; this was starting to move into the university. Music was, and uh, so they needed to justify and sort of scientificify, <laughs> scienceify, uh, scienceify. Yeah, scientific study. I think it's scientific. Scientific. I like that. That's <laughs> okay. They wanted to scientific it and make it a rational study. Um, and then there were others who just, you know, refused to do that or felt that that was not the right way to go. And who are, and were, who are some of those and, people? Well, I studied with George Rockberg. Uh -huh. that he was, I mean, I studied with many people, but he was maybe the person I studied with the longest. Um, Considered I was with the, him until the, his death. The father of postmodernism and music. Um, yeah. Yeah. Before Barrio. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I always like to point out he's he European, so he got the. So Barrio would be another example of someone who's more on the romantic side, more writing from yep. writing from the heart, I guess, if you want to trivialize it a well, little bit. Or looking to the past to say, you know, you can't break from the past. You can't just decide that Mozart didn't exist and that that doesn't have an influence on us today, and that didn't mean anything to our culture or to our psyche. Okay, <laughs> because it does. And so the right? interesting and thing so, that Rockberg did, and and this is directly tied, I think, uh, in a in a really interesting way to musical identity, is that he was yeah. maybe the first person, at least the first known composer, to really just grab bits of old music and put them in his music. So he would put like Bach a lot, um, Mozart, you know, the great, the great, uh, the great composers of the classical and Baroque and Romantic era, just pop them directly into his scores. Right. And he would recontextualize them. So you'd have uh, a piece that I have come to play a lot is Nach Bach. This is one of his works. That means piano, after, after which, Bach. After Bach, right? Yeah. And the idea there is that there are fragments of Bach flying around inside this very, uh, very modern, other otherworldly texture. And so you, it's a, it's a little psychedelic. I mean, in a way, yeah. right? Um, kind of. But the idea, and then Jim George would also later he would um, compose in the style of these composers and around their music even, so that it was never clear what was him, what was them, maybe, or at least. It's hard to tell, and you can fool trained musicians with this stuff. Um, but ultimately, that distilled, I think, into a, an acceptance of, and what we see today, the influence that that had is it was an acceptance of bringing, keeping the past alive in a modern setting. I mean, that's sort of the idea, that's postmodernism, and that's uh, what his legacy, I think, in part is. So, Rockberg, I know, is, you know, your, I would say, your primary, you know, composition mentor in your life he's the person who seems to have had you know the most drastic effect on you as a composer and as a as a person who thinks about music um, and he obviously had a very deep relationship with musical influence and identity um, so you I think that was probably one of the things that attracted you to him as a teacher and as a mentor um, so how did that how did that go from, oh, I'm studying with this great person and I'm what, you know, I'm, you were young when you started studying with him. Um, yep. 
how did that go from that to sort of how you incorporated that into your work, um, both musical and um, technical work? Well, boy, that's a huge, <laughs> that's a, I mean, that's. Tell me about your life's yeah, work, Greg. So, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I have a, I literally have outlines to, to write a book about some of this actually. So it's a big topic. I don't know how to summarize it probably very quickly. Um, suffice it to say, the idea, so the, the, the fact that music to me, and this is very relevant to identity and to what we're going to get into about codifying this, that music to me is an, is an act. It's something that a person does and can offer <laughs> to others. That meant that I, I mean, this is why I studied piano. I needed, it, because I wanted to be a composer, but I needed to study piano to have a mastery of an instrument to understand what it took to make sound out of a essentially percussion instrument, to make it music that came out of it, to understand how other people throughout the years had um, treated that instrument to make music happen with it, so that I could then turn around and write music that would also do that, to, that, that would contain that not magic sauce, but now I'm going to start getting metaphysical on this here. <laughs> and when I say metaphysical, I don't, I mean metaphorical, but George saw it as metaphysical too, which is to say he saw it as like a life and death struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has a book of essays called The Aesthetics of Survival, and he's talking about how you can't, you know, there's many things he's talking about, but he's, he's saying the survival of culture to him um, was essential to the survival of humanity, basically, and that we can't lose the past, and so and and that music has to be a thing that's uh, that we make, that we share, that has deep, deep meaning culturally, historically, and to us today, and that it can't just be, it shouldn't just be an experience that just passes over us, and we just sort of, you know, let it flow, and then we turn it off. Okay, right. it has to be something that we engage in. So, and now I would like to turn this around because your your background you have a background in composition too and 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 performance. But I want to but you did a lot of theory work. So I want to ask you, did this stuff come up in theory? I mean, did you know? I've never met a theorist. I have maybe one who like would talk about music in these terms of the cosmic, you know, zeitgeist and the the flow of ideas <laughs> that are bigger than a person, you know, that kind of thing, like. How yeah. did that work in theory? Did you find that happening? No, <laughs> no. The theorists don't do that. Um, it's not that they don't think that way. It's that they're not interested typically in writing uh, or in that way. Um, so you might have okay. conversations with theorists, even great ones, you know, that, that kind of sound the, the same as the conversations you might have had with George. But when you when you read their work... Well, George's work was writing the music down. When he wrote the music down, um, you know, all of those concepts flew. They didn't matter, right? In a way, because mm, mm. this is his work that he made. Yep. And for theorists, that the equivalent of that is is what they write about how music works, right? So I would say it's similar in that way. So they they might think that way, but it doesn't matter because they're certainly not going to put that in their book. Um, mm -hmm. Because theorists are more interested in getting into the technical details of the, you know, the workings, the mechanics of music. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things that happened on that front and the, the thing that really has inspired me um, in my work and my thinking, you know, for a very long time is the turn from just looking at the music and looking at the score and trying to parse that, which is really interesting. And there's a lot you can do there. And I've done a lot of that, but Going from that to turning to how the mind processes music um, mm. and how that affects the identity of that music and what it is and what it means and how it works, uh, I think is mm -hmm. maybe that's one of my top topics. It's a hot, it's a hot topic for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's like the most interesting thing there is to look at. Um, yeah, so maybe we could just talk about that and how that has worked you know, we talked about the change from, you know, pre-World War II to post-World War II um, composition, uh, which was just a, a massive overhaul of for ev everything. Well, basically of every <laughs> everything cultural on Earth uh, was overhauled by that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, certainly music. And 
you know, music theory as a discipline took a little bit longer uh, to come into its own. And I would say one of the major developments that made that happen was, you know, was this turn to how the, how the mind processes music. Um, oh, my dog is interested in moving around right now. Something, That's okay. Something is happening and Peanut needs to know. She can get in there. That's all right. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. So. Well. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say we can go back to the 50s and 60s when this sort of theory sort of began, but maybe more we bring it a little closer to home around the around the 80s. Right? Yeah. Well, in the early 80s, um, I was born. It's important. <laughs> the modern Republican Party was born. MTV mm -hmm. was born. And a generative theory of tonal music was born. <laughs> oh <my laughs> this God. was a super, yeah, Greg knows this text very well. Um, this was a I super do. important turning point um, for, for music theory. And I would say for just thinking about music in general um, and studying it in a more rigorous and scientific way, which as Greg said, you know, people started trying to think about it that way earlier, but I would say the 80s was when it actually started to happen. Um, the GTTM, people were looking to codify meaning. That's how it started. They, they, the people were, you know, they understood the structure of music with theory, plenty of tools for that. And then some people started to say, but how do we capture meaning? How do we codify meaning? That eventually led to some of this work. Yeah, yeah. And the great book, Emotion and Meaning of Music by Leonard Meyer kind of kicked that off earlier. Um, and by the 80s, people were, were trying to, to come up with testable verifiable theories, you know, yeah. about, about that. Um, and I think one of the first really successful ones and probably um, one of the most influential moments for music theory as a discipline um, was GTTM or Generative Theory of Tonal Music. So this was written by Lairdall and Jackendoff, um, Fred Lairdall and Ray Jackendoff, and uh, I think 83, probably, somebody can correct me. I thought me. 82. W one of the interesting things about them is that Fred Lairdahl is a composer, not a theorist, and Ray Jackendoff was a linguist, not a musician. Yeah, so they got That's together. Really, um, yeah. And they were both really into gestalt psychology uh, concepts as well. They read a lot of that. And, you know, I'm not a linguist, so hopefully I'm not getting this super wrong, but I, they were heavily, uh, Jackendoff was heavily influenced by Chomsky, is my understanding, and generative They were at Columbia, right? Yes. Um, okay. And yeah, so they were looking at um, music as a mentally constructed entity. And this is really the first time that music theory, I would say, becomes a branch, honestly, of cognitive, mm. so, what they called cognitive science at the time, um, or maybe theoretical mm -hmm. psychology. So they weren't really, you know, you'll see them analyze scores, but what they're really trying to do is analyze how our minds process music. Um, so they were looking at components um, that that influence, components of the music that influence our cognition of it. So they looked at things like the grouping structure they, they called. So when you look at their analyses, these are kind of the, the bits of the analysis that you see, or if you try to do a GTTM style analysis, this is what you do. So you, um, you, you create structures that are groups. And for them, this is a generic term, right? So and music can have groups on many levels, but it's just any salient musical segment. So it could be a motive, it could be a phrase, it could be a section, a theme group. So we need we need to figure out how to segment this stuff. Um, then they looked at metrical structure, which is uh, just simply patterns of strong and weak beats. So how do we tap our toes to this? Things like that. Um, what's the pulse that we feel? Um, and mm -hmm. then they would do what they call time span reductions. And these are kind of the links between the, the grouping structures and the pitch and the rhythm. And then something very interesting that I, I find really fascinating that they would do is uh, they would look at what they called prolongation um, and they would try to reduce the prolongation. And this is just patterns of what we perceive as tension and relaxation. So this may be, maybe coincides with grouping structures and may be different. Um, just depending on the way the music is written. Uh, there are a lot of criticisms of this work. I mean, pro I would guess hundreds of papers have criticized the GTTM mm -hmm. rightfully. Um, and yet, and yet when I came up and 
took theory, there was a lot of discussion about tension and release and these very simple, these much these 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 principles of grouping and structures and such. Well, that's um, the thing. There's a lot. There's a lot to criticize, but it they turned out to be in a lot of ways really on the right. I would say on the right track. Um, yeah. You know, they were only their theory. They wanted it to be very scientific. So as with a lot of you know, especially like if you look at behavioral studies about music, for example, they're very limited because in order to create a viable scientific experiment, you you have to isolate variables, blah, blah, blah. All these things are very hard in music. So like like that, you know, uh, Laird Allen Jackendorf did this on very simple monophonic melodies, basically. Um, they mm -hmm. were really only looking at melodies, which like obviously is a tiny piece of what we hear when we hear music. They didn't have anything to do mm -hmm. with timbre. Um, they, uh, you know, th they made a lot of claims about universality, which have actually not turned out to be totally wrong, which is interesting that there have been mm -hmm. lots of um, actual experiments to test these things in the, you know, in the 40 years since this was written. And, but they, you know, it's like non-falsifiable claims, very non-scientific stuff. Um, and also they only worked on the Western music, tonal music canon. Um, now, it's in, as an anecdote here, so I, we, we can get into this, but I came to the GTTM as I began my own process trying to deep dive into building Clio, which we talked about last episode, uh, and I needed to understand how I might bridge musical mood and meaning into analysis and such like this because I wanted to codify it. So they, I learned about the T GTTM after graduate school this way. Yeah. Um, but as I understand it, from people I know who know Fred Laridal, um, you know, he was really trying to find find ways to justify the uh, romantic side of composition in a way. Like, in mm -hmm. other words, he was trying to say, we can't process, I think, this was his personal motivation, probably where a lot of the intuition came from. But he was saying, we can't process a lot of this extremely mathematically derived break from the past kind of music. Our brains can't do it. Our ears can't do it. And this is why, kind of, right? Yeah. That's where a lot of that motivation was secretly. And I think he was very, he, I think he was just flat wrong about that. Um, I think that was a personal preference that, you know, that, that mm -hmm. seeped into his work. And it, it turned out to point him at some really interesting things that, that actually are pretty universal. Um, but, you know, to say we can't understand, I do think there are probably, I mean, we know there are patterns that are too complex for us to process, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't actually think it's because we can't. I think it's because we don't, uh, for the most part. I'm sure there's a, a hard limit. I don't know anything about what that would be, but um, this kind of brings me to, you know, another really interesting person in this same lineage in history um, and we'll we'll skip around a little bit because it's directly related to this, which is David Huron. And we can talk a little bit more about his book and his theories. He wrote a book called Sweet Anticipation. This was much later, so in 2008. So, you know, significantly later than the GTTM, certainly influenced by it. And, but and the, the, the title, Sweet Anticipation, is referring to the idea of that tension and release that we were just referring to, right? Yeah, he had a, a really novel theory of, and has actually continued to develop this and gone even beyond music uh, to develop a, an entire, uh, very compelling theory that is called the ITPRA theory. It's a theory of expectation that, you know, that kind of has been influential and, and deals with how we interact with the world in general. Um, so ITPRA meaning imagination, tension, back to tension, prediction, reaction, and appraisal. Um, so he has a theory of how those, that series of things uh, of mental structures is how we process everything that's incoming. Um, and it's especially- So we're playing a game as we experience something like music. We're playing a game with ourselves where we hear something, we process, we, we feel tension, we predict what we think is going to happen. Then we appraise what really did happen and feel- good or bad about yeah. the result. Yeah, and, and so when we're enjoying something, um, you know, whether it be a film or a piece of music, he would say that mm. we're, not, we're not just enjoying it, you know, just because it's great or beautiful or intense or whatever. What we're actually enjoying about it is our own predictions 
that we've made in, in our in our subconscious mind being wrong or right. And the way in which that works, so, you know, we we always like them to be right. That's always a nice feeling like, oh, I was right about that. You know, our brains like that. But it turns out we also like to be wrong, but only in very particular ways, right? There are ways that you can you can uh, craft a piece of music that bucks our predictions and is great and we like that. Or you can craft a piece of music that that bucks our predictions and we hate it. Um, but back mm. back to the back to Laird all, um, and why I think that you know I think that David Huron has a a much more interesting take on on you know the tension release expectation issue, and and more universal is that mm -hmm. you know David Huron talked about you know one of his major I think a major breakthrough in thinking about music was what he called statistical learning. So what he said is our our minds are forming, you know, what's essentially a statistical analysis as we listen, you know, our entire lives. We're, we're forming a, a basis for how we think music works, and it comes from what we hear, right? Uh, and yes, there are some universals, but really, we're creating this, you know, in our own minds throughout our entire we're, lives. We're, we're being trained. We're being trained like an LLM, yep. sort of, yep. uh, from the beginning. We hear Sesame Street whatever, we hear early music uh, as a child and we, we're getting trained on how music functions and how it works and what we expect it to do and how, right? Yep. In, in some detailed ways, even though we don't understand necessarily the theoretical structure of this, we're getting, much like spoken language, we accumulate that intuition and knowledge through yep. training. So we okay. intuit um, what's going to happen in music that is at least somewhat in the realm of things that we're familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, you know, one of the problems with the Mathier 20th century music, let's say starting with Schoenberg, um, and I mean, Boulez is a great example. Boulez is very, very difficult music uh, to parse, you know, mm -hmm. as you listen. Um, but I would say it's not, you know, unlike what Lairdall seems to have thought, it's not that, you know, we're not made to do that or that we can't do that. It's that we haven't done it. You know, most of us didn't spend our childhood listening to Schoenberg and Boulez. Um, we listen to Sesame Street. We listen to stuff that, you know, it's complex because it's stuff that was influenced both by, you know, Western classical music and also, you know, music in the blues tradition, right? So, uh, and there are some related things there, but, um, you know, w what we certainly didn't grow up listening to is, you know, structure, like <laughs> we, we can't. And so what if, what if we had? Yeah. What and if we are had there people who have, uh, are there people who have, can we, <laughs> uh, there probably are. I mean, I bet a lot of, you know, I bet a lot of great conductors started listening to that early. Those I know that my experience listeners. was as a graduate student in my you know, and in my teens and twenties, like I became aware of this music and spent a lot of time with this, with this music because I knew it was important. I also knew it didn't come easily, and I played it, I listened to it, studied it, and in doing so, I definitely began to find the. I found a new way of listening, is I guess how I would say it. I found an ebb and flow with it that uh, felt very, feels very natural today, even. Yeah. And oh, me too. In fact, in a way, it's it's sort of warped my hearing so that when I compose something that's a little bit out there, even just a little bit, a lot of people find it. Just <laughs> I'm not sure how to follow it. I don't know what's going on. To me, I mean, it's almost silly how simple the structure might be or how clear I've made it. But it's not always obvious. But I think my mind has warped a little bit to to be a little more open from all that years and years of deep, intense listening yeah. and playing. Well, I've had the same experience. You know, I've I also spent a lot of time with um, pretty complex 20th century music, uh, both sure. listening and with a score. Uh, for me, the score working with the scores helped a lot um, with my listening. You know, because I was able to parse them that way, and then. Mm -hmm. you know, use those, that understanding to listen. So anyway, the educated listener is a very interesting topic actually, um, mm. because it, it does a hundred percent there, are, you know, probably dozens, if not hundreds of studies at this point, behavioral studies, mostly proving that educated musicians um, listen differently. 
you know, they're just, you hear things differently. You hear finer segments, right? You hear more segments um, if you know what's going on. Well, and how could that not be the case? And yet, culturally, at this moment in time, it is elitism and it's very frowned upon, right? This is not something we should ever say or talk about yet. That's why we should do a podcast episode on it, but well, we should later maybe. But, uh, um, well, mu music elitism can it, behaving in an elitist way is never good for anyone. But the idea that some music does take a lot of work and is a lot of it, it takes a lot of effort is not that's just true. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does mean that that listenership will be limited and of, certainly, especially given the way we uh, we we take in music today. But right, stick the white things in your ears and go about your. Go about go, go about sure. your business. The soundtrack of your life, right? Um. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite of what uh, Rockberg wanted to see happen. Um, sure, or he felt was essential to the survival of culture, and you know, so he was a Jewish man, you know, who fought in World War II. This is worth mentioning that yeah. you know, like uh, on the American side as an as an American soldier, and. This is important because he lived that struggle very directly. That particular, the death of the the attempting ex, attempt to extinguish a culture. Yeah, his culture. In a right, yeah, his yeah. culture. Um, so he certainly had a very different kind of re re uh, relationship to that yeah. survival that would than we would today. Um, yeah, that really he, changes the the idea of the aesthetics of survival when you know that about him. Um, he's just such an... I, I never met him, but I wish I had. And uh, in my life, he's just such an interesting character. You know, I've gotten to hear so many great stories about him from you over the years. Um, and, you know, studied him in school. He's just absolutely incredible composer. Um, but yeah, that, that experience must have been... You, you don't come back from that. You, that changes you in fundamental ways that bleed into everything you do. There's a colleague of mine from Eastman who just wrote an autobiography, or I'm sorry, not an autobiography, a biography of, of him. And it was, but it, it, that's not quite right. It's specifically about his change, um, uh, cultural and, and, and artistic aesthetic change from before, before the war to after the war, because it was significant. And uh, in fact, she interviewed me. I'm in the book actually uh, having a post-mortem conversation with him. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty cool at the end, but um, but in the book though, she talks about how like his handwriting. She, she was going through all of his documents, um, and his handwriting before the war was one way, and then after it was all different, and the notate the way he wrote music was different. Like everything about it, him was different. Um, that's pr I, I mean that that's that can't be an isolated case, and. That's not something to be lost or forgotten. And just, just because we're not experiencing that today, that's something that happened to humanity that I think is worth worth noting. But we're kind of getting off topic here. But um Ooh, that's a but that's a big that's a big Yeah. We need to maybe just sit here and breathe for a minute after talking. That's a very intense topic. <laughs> well um but yeah, so, let's let's go back to um you know, circling back to these kind of pivotal people and thinkers and and uh, lines and people of who are trying they're trying to codify meaning yeah. in music or emotional reaction or cognition really how can we what's our limit what how do we parse it yeah yeah so not just how does music not, not just how does music get structured but how do we pull it back apart when we hear it and experience it which let's be sure to to also talk about how that how we think you know how that? How does that relate to to musical identity, which is our actual topic here? Um, mm -hmm. So let's let's circle back around. Why are we always circling back? I'm tired. I'm I'm gonna stop saying that. Sorry, everybody. This is what reverse happens. the train. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. No, go forward, picking up another path. I don't know. <laughs> our brains it. have been turned into ooze by business jargon. Um, Let's circle back mm. to mm -hmm. a little dude called Eugene Narmour. So this is kind of the third, what I would consider, big stake in the ground of, of you know, music analysis or thinking specifically about music. Uh, and this was, he, he came along before and was probably very influential on David Huron. 
Um, and he came up with something called the implication realization model, which um, it ha- also like the GTTM, G- G- how many T's are in that? GTTM uh, has gestalt underpinnings. So I know that's something that you have been super influenced by. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about the implication realization model. Yes. So I found the GTTM and then quickly found Narmor through through musician friends, not theorists, but through musician friends. It's weird because they were so well. They were so attracted to what he, what these people were writing about, and the way they were approaching music theory because it's so intuitively clear to a practicing musician. And the, anyway, so it was very interesting. And so I went to Penn and met Narmor and talked to him about my work uh, and wanted to codify it. Now. Um, this was in the early 2000s when I was doing my work. So only about 10 years after he had published this stuff, mm-hmm. which it has since been clinically uh, tested. And there's a lot of work that's been done on his work. His work has had just, as you're saying, a wave of influence on everything that's come before or after. But the idea simply is, it's the sort of a, a very mathy version of the Huron concept, which is you can have an event, a musical event, you can have another musical event. Those two, this is the watered down version. Those two events in proximity now create an expectation, an implication of a third event, which we haven't experienced yet. So when we hear that third event, it's realized. And the question becomes to mix Huron and Narmor, how much did we, how, how satisfied were we uh, uh, with, with that resolution or with that? resolution uh, that realization Mm -hmm. how dissatisfied how much did we expect it did we predict it how accurate were we if we are and here's the short here's the super short of the long term of this if i keep providing these events that thwart your predictions if i just constantly thwart your predictions and create randomized stochastic (laughs) events you will be bored you will not hear music you will not remember what happened Mm. 15 seconds ago, you will just have an experience and you can feel how you feel about it. So there'll be no no musical identity to that whatsoever. That's right. The identity kind of goes to zero because you can't get there. You can't figure out what it is and you stop trying. If instead though, if I go to the other extreme and I just keep giving you exactly what you predict all the time, every step of the way, you will be bored again because there's nothing interesting here. You're just hearing a scale or whatever, you're just hearing the most obvious continuation of the previous events. And you develop um, what I what I devised, you, de- you develop an equity mm. to that process and you need it to surprise you at some point. That's important. You need it to surprise you in that sweet anticipation kind of way. You need to be able to predict, have it be wrong in just enough of a way that you're engaged and you want to know who done it. You want to know what's next. You want to know the answer, right? So hold on. You said something really interesting in there. Um, Well, it was all super interesting, obviously. Thank you. But you said, (laughs) but you said, oops, um, you said develop an equity. Um, Yeah. So I think what you mean by that is like you put equity in a in a home in a home, right? You're putting it literally. You're just yeah. you're putting money in the bank account. You're like you're like you, you make a prediction. You're right. You're like awesome. You get a little coin in the I'm right jar. You do it again. I'm right jar. I do it again. I'm right. Uh oh, now I'm not right. And that was really surprised me. And the more equity you build up, the more impact that surprise will have. Typically, right? So. Um, yeah, this is this is the underpinnings of a lot of what I codified and built into Clio in terms of its analysis of musical language. So maybe um, maybe you could give some, you know, let's talk with some specificity a little bit about that. Um, okay. About the different parameters. So obviously one of the things that's difficult about studying music in any sort of scientific way is that there are lots and lots of parameters when you're listening to music. So we can talk about melody, um, which is essentially frequency and order of frequency and how long and short each frequency is. Um, time series data. Yeah, time series data, if you want to get real real nerdy about it. Um, mm-hmm. You can talk about just about rhythm, just about the onset, event onsets, how long they last and how they relate to each other, how, you know, metrical mm-hmm. grouping, like Laird all talked about. 
Um, you can talk about um, timbre, which is something that's super hard and something that the, the lab I used to be in at McGill has really focused on over the years, um, which is how do you codify timbre, right? Like how do you, um, how mm. does that play into all of these? Because these are all kind of simplistic, you know, we need these very basic, here we have a melody, you know, it has eight notes, they're in this order, they're, it, it, it's super obvious to analyze something like that. But as soon as you add timbre or orchestration, like that goes out the well, window, right? Harmony. Yeah. I would add harmony. Yeah. Not to, only that. So po- yeah. Yeah. Po- polyphony and that and, and harmony is melody, but it's coincidental melody. And so that will change whatever you perceive as that top melody. It can change very directly its meaning. So it's just layer so, on layer on layer on layer, right? And this is what yep. has made it very hard. And, and in fact, you know, like every one of these could be a book because, like you just mentioned, rhythm sort of. Okay, we have pulses and all of that, and we want it, but but there are there are pulse patterns that can be ambiguous. That mm-hmm. could be many different. That could be set up and structured in many different ways that would all be justifiable. And then there's a gogic accent, which is a rhythmical accent that in a melody that will create the illusion or the perception of an accent that isn't accented, an mm. accented event that has more importance, mm. but it isn't in any other way, except that rhythmically it's been accented. Leaned right? on. So yeah. Leaned on in some way. Yeah. yeah. So this these interact in ways they get it gets very complicated very quickly because they interact and they go very deep into how they actually present themselves in any music. So Let's take um, let's take the idea the, this idea and this is something we worked on a lot in Clio the idea of the perceptual pulse pattern. So a lot of times you know people in general music land, you know you go on YouTube and you start listening to people talk about music. Uh, they'll talk to you about BPMs, um, right? Um, which is beats <laughs> yes. per minute, and it's an you know it's an uh-huh. easy metric to talk about, uh, and typically people think that that's how tempo works. It's BPMs, right? (laughs) Um, And that's, that's, uh, I mean, we're laughing because it's just, it's very oversimplified um, because there is... It's a number. Yeah, it's a number number that has something to do with how we perceive the pulse, usually, probably, um, if it's, you know, if it's calculated well. Um, BPMs, sorry, means beats per minute. Um, So that means... The idea is if you're tapping your toe to, you know, or if you're clapping along with a, a piece of music, it's going at a certain number of beats or pulses per minute, and that's just a convenient number that we can use to estimate tempo. Um, but talk talk about perceptual pulse patterns a little bit, because that, that's a much more interesting well, way of dealing with rhythm yeah. in the context of these implication and realization type models, right? I want to do that, and then I want to jump back to to George and the metaphysics of this. Ooh! Actually. Oh my God! You can go so, from perceptual pulse patterns oh yeah. to metaphysics. All right. Absolutely. So I created that phrase, pe- "perpetual pulse patterns." It's in a you can't even pattern say it. You didn't create it. That we have. <laughs> I did, and the reason I did that, I created that, was because as the more we did this work, I realized that um, you know the idea of rhythm, whatever that means. The you know there are so what is the bass drum doing? What is that? guitar pattern doing? What is the vocalist doing? Rhythm. We can write it down. That's fine. Um, But much more of an impact in terms of how we feel about the mood and the experience of music that we're hearing is that perpetual, I'm sorry, perceptual (laughs) pulse pattern. How are we feeling? So we can have very slow music that feels very fast on the surface. So we can have a very slow moving underlying pulse that has a lot of activity over top that feels very fast. Mm-hmm. And that still may feel slow, actually, depending on how how much of an impact the overall harmony and timbre and texture of the music gives it. Mm-hmm. So in other words, if I create big, huge downbeats with very small filigree we'll say and you know and i do the big downbeats very slowly that will feel lumbering and powerful and whatever if i instead make those very fast moving bits uh have lots of accents that pop way out and are equal or greater uh intensity to the 
to the bar, um, I will it will feel much faster than that. That's a perception that we get. And this completely trans- completely idea. transcends um, genre or type of music. Yes. There's no, yes. you don't even have to think about that. I can think of dozens of examples of slow music with fast on top textures from all kinds of, of different music. Um, and whether it's universal or not doesn't matter to me. It certainly is true enough to have an effect on what almost anyone in today's world would find to be mm. mood or, you know, meaning. So I'm not going to be scientific about it, but I know that this does work. True enough to have an effect. That's an interesting difference between, you know, sitting in academia and having to write papers and, you know, being, let's say, an industry and having to sell things. Um, You know, you go from having to be like 99.9% correct and prove it to, yeah, if you're 80% correct, that's, you know, well, it's pretty good. And more more to the point in academics, to me, you have to get down to some tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver of an aspect of what you really want to do and say. And you have to spend two or three years yeah. publishing on that and testing it. And, oh, my and God. So this is, aside from the fact that I needed to keep my intellectual property when I was striking out with this stuff, I left university because I knew, I knew that I didn't want to go down that path. I would spend my life grinding out small details of a small thing and I thought I could get much more of an effect by just making it work. Yeah, tell but me about I, it. If I can if I can yeah, you that was your your trajectory full speed. Um I want to go back to the George thing though, which is to say we, we were just talking about BPM and tempo and mm-hmm. the idea of what that is because you can have something as we just described at 72 beats per minute and it will feel slow. You can have it at 72 beats per minute. It will feel extremely fast. Or at least active. And, yeah. And that or, is such yeah. an important difference to note if you're talking about two pieces of music. So it's worth noting, and George would go on about this a lot, like talking about what is the tempo. Tempo mattered a lot to George, the right tempo. Mm-hmm. So he would say, you know, like in in so the metronome was a fairly late invention, by the way. Uh, it wasn't, you know, to have a machine that could tick time uh, Accurately. consistently yeah. was some, yeah, was something. So people, composers, did not necessarily write down seventy two beats per minute. Um, earlier, early composers instead they would write largo. They would write andante. They would so they would write these the, Italian it was words speeds that um, that are related to something in life. Right, so walk walking speed. Um, yeah, yeah. Or 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 something in nature, or people would get a feeling of what andante meant or what presto meant. But George would point out, and of course this is true, presto or andante in Handel is not the same as Mozart, and it's not the same in Beethoven. These things change over time. They change on the musical context. There's no defined tempo. When people say that classical musicians are just uh, repeating the score. Anyway, that's just absolute nonsense. There's so much that goes into doing that, and why these why why hundreds of people record <laughs> the Beethoven sonatas because their takes on them are extremely different and unique in very important ways. But um, tempo is a piece of this, and in fact, I mean, the, I always love this one. The Glenn Gould he recorded the Goldberg Variations twice, and. Mm. Uh, the the first recording was what forty minutes or thirty five minutes, and the second recording is an hour. That's insane. The difference in temp. Now there's reasons he's taking repeats and things, but but it's also his temp tempo. He had uh, a really different. insane relationship with tempo. <laughs> I would say yep. I'll never forget the Very first unique. time. The first time I heard Glenn Gould play, I I hit play on him playing the Mozart <laughs> Mozart sonatas, and like <laughs> I just burst out laughing because they were obsessively fast like yeah insane sounding and i never heard anything yeah, like you, that you you think your cd player at the time was broken or something like yeah. <laughs> you know or something's wrong it's playing back too fast but tempo matters so much mm-hmm. and so my point is that in this metaphysical conversation uh in talking about that with with other composers and as a student composer um it it has everything to do with how that feels and how you're going to express that feeling at whatever the BPM marking is. Um, how does it? What's what's the emotional impact? What's the meaning that you're that you're conveying? And this. And so I took that. And this conversation about this one very specific aspect of music, as you said, mm-hmm. this this conversation can be had over and over again. 
because music has, you know, I would say 10 or 15 aspects that you would have to look at in these same ways. And then not only would you have to look at them, do you have to look at them separately? Sorry, I keep hitting my stupid mic. Um, not only do you have to look at them separately, you have to look at how they interplay. So how they interact with each other. Um, and that I would say, if there's one, if there's one golden goose in terms of musical identity, that's what it is. You have to look at these, um, these patterns of of tension and relaxation, well, of anticipation okay. on all these levels, and mm -hmm. how they work together to form what we consider to be a single piece of music. Um, yep. Yeah. Or momentary affect. You're exactly right that you you take all of this from the GTTM in terms of blocking and chunking and segmenting bits of salient music mm -hmm. to the Narmor expectations to the the collective Huron uh, predictive statistical training that we have to how good or bad we feel at certain points of tension and release to the idea of what is rhythm anyway and how do we perceive it and what effect does it really have I mean, on and on and on. Um, you have to layer all those, weight them differently, and and that begins to give a, a machine a sense. If you can codify those things, it begins to give the, a machine a way to identify and separate and categorize and search on mood and effect of yeah. music. But it's a very complicated cognitive approach that has to be taken. Right, and and, you know... The, the machine does not have that history of statistical learning that we have. Um, there's you could probably I, get it. Yeah, I mean, you would have to model. you'd have to teach it, right? And you'd have to teach it some of these things that we're talking about, um, which is you know kind of the work that we did um, with Clio was was about that. I, I read recently. Mm -hmm. I saw that um, there's a lab that's um, that's working on. Recreating well, there are lots of lots of people doing this. Um, some pretty intense work on using um, AI models to recreate uh, patterns that are happening in the brain. So trying to figure out what people are mm -hmm. thinking um, by yep. you know so somehow placing electrodes in different places in different ways, measuring the activity of but the brain, and then recreating observing the brain. Yeah, observing the brain. Observing the brain physically. Knowing what yeah. physically, um, yeah. you know, with yeah. an, an electrical interface, and then uh, using an AI to look at those um, signals that it's producing and trying in to, different people in different people and trying to reproduce what that person is thinking, right? And this is mm -hmm. obviously terrifying in certain ways, and also like most terrifying things, also extremely exciting. You know, uh, the idea that we could yeah. read our own minds. Um, but I saw I saw recently. You know, someone was able to to do this and reproduce. Someone who was listening to Pink Floyd's uh, "Another Brick in the Wall," and they were able to produce a very um, a very fuzzy version, but hearable version of that. Uh, and if you haven't heard that, go look it up. It's really cool. Um, and it really reminded me of you know what I always imagined Cleo was kind of hearing. It's like the reverse process. We were trying to take That's right. We were trying to take these very clear to us musical recordings, um, and the machine was getting this like this you know this version of it that was real and was close and like it was there, but it wasn't crystal clear, right? And this this had to do with a lot of technical issues with doing that, but. Um, yeah, I think in, I th in, in my work, in my work after Clio, uh, in the 10 years since then, um, a lot of what I did was focused on this kind of thing where I would build a model from input, take the model, separate it from the input, and then have to reconstruct it specifically to see how accurate was that model? How fuzzy is that model? How, how do I want it to be represented really? Um, because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot, a lot going on there to do that. Um, but anyway, that's exactly the kind of experimentation I was working on. Yeah. Or have been working on. Yeah. Yeah. So that translation between, you know, between our cognitive processes and the real world and then throw in, you know, throw in a computer to that mix. 
Um, and you get a, a very, very complex and difficult problem. Um, but, but imagine the create the creative possibilities, right? So for creativity to come. So let's say I take a piece of music that I like, I love the shape of it, all the nuances, and I make an accurate model of it. But now what I want to do is I want to keep that the, some aspects of the core model, the tension and release, the expectation, the realization of those expectations. I want to keep those concepts of that model, but I want totally different notes in play, mm. <laughs> totally different music, totally different instrumentation and rhythm, totally different tempo maybe. But I, so you see what I mean? I can take the core identity. This mm -hmm. is what we're talking about here. The core identity of this piece and transplant it into, like the soul of the piece, transplant it into a new piece with a different surface. But is that's so interesting. I mean, the, the surface, it's funny that you say that. I've been actually doing a songwriting exercise for myself recently. That's exactly, exactly that. Um, per, oh. Just personally, where I take a song that I like, um, uh, and I try to make a version of it that that uses the the structural framework of it um, on that abstract level, not not oh these chords. Mm -hmm. No, it yep. has this pattern of tension release. Um, you know, it's because it's you can limit yourself long. in interesting ways. Yeah. Well, so you, you can say this phrase is eight bars, so I'm going to keep my phrase to be eight bars. It has this pattern of tension and release. I'm going to make my own harmony have that pattern. The lyrics go here to there. I'm going to do something that else that's here to there, right? You can, is that what you mean? You're mapping yeah. these. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And so my question for myself is, and I'm, I'm just curious about this, and it's related to what you just said, is it is it all the musical details that make us love it so much? You know, I'm taking like classic, mm -hmm. you know, classic things like landslide, you know, Um I don't know what you don't that know. is. Okay, it's Landslide. a really it's a really famous song um, by uh, Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac did it. Um, okay, it's like a seminal, beautiful love song. And okay. Okay. is it is it the surface? Is it you know one thing we haven't talked about in terms of identity? And I think any listener will be like, why aren't they talking about this? Um, is a person's voice right? So if we're talking about music with voice, that's the first thing anyone would think about. Well, I identify music by the person singing it, uh, which is huge, obviously. That's that's true. Um, you know, we're, we're trained, you know, talk about something where our brains are statistically trained on is, uh, you know, recognizing and understanding the human voice, right? That's like well, the okay. most important. And what's it's also what's of value case in point, Katy Perry, I think last week just sold her entire music catalog to an investment firm. Cool. <laughs> you know this? Cool. For for $350 million. Now, the value, is the value in the keyboardist? Because they were, pro this, it's all of her like five, six albums or something. Is it in the keyboardist? Is it in the bass player? Is it in the drummer? <laughs> Where's yeah. the value? The value is in her voice, her her brand, uh, basically. Her brand, her yeah, because, persona, because exactly. Because her voice becomes a, a proxy um, for that's something it. something larger and cultural. So yeah, I guess that's an important important thing to point out that you know yes, the human voice, yes, yes, yes. But in current contemporary music, you know that most people are are putting in their in their earbuds, um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And there are business interests that are dictating you know a lot of what's happening and. Those things are not what we're talking about here when we talk about musical identity. And it's really hard because that's been such a huge part of our lives and our listening. Um, you know, record labels have determined a lot about how we listen to music, um, for sure. And so it's hard to parse, you know, what is cultural and what is musical at this point, at least for me. I have to think really hard about it when I try to do it and be sure that I'm not letting... Um, non-musical things bleed into my musical, purely musical thinking. Not that there's anything wrong with talking well, about cultural things, but... I you, think yeah. it would be... I, I don't know if this is a weird thing to say. It feels weird, but it's this. If Could you get an investment firm to pay $350 million for Beethoven? All, like um, all Beethoven? That's a great right. question. It, <laughs> if, if, if that were something you could own, and I don't think you could... Because what value does that have? Katy Perry will have a value for the next 10, 20 years. Probably, yeah. Um, but her value today, right now, monetarily speaking, is far higher than Beethoven. 
So clearly there are extra musical things going on there. I mean, that's exactly right. She became a brand. She has, there's, there's a lot of cachet there. So there's a way that they're going to recoup that value and more. And they're, they're positioned to do that. So they're going to do it as a business. Um, but we're, as you say, very important point. We are not talking about that kind of value or identity. We're talking about the core identity of the music. And why is that more interesting to me anyway? Because it will, it will, it's not the immediate stage of where AI is going to be, where they're cloning people's voices. Mm. That's very pretty simple, actually. It's not simple, but it's a pretty basic way of grasping at somebody's identity. It's Much conceptually more simple. Is, it's technically conceptually hard, conceptually simple. simple, yeah. But what's much more interesting is someone's identity and the, their body of work, the, the way they play, the way they compose, the, the meaning that they produce, the effect that they can have. This goes for film composers and all wide range of anybody making music that has an impact yeah. socially. So if I had to How wrap, does that... Yeah, if I had to wrap it you know, with a bow, it's that mm -hmm. the kind of musical identity that we're trying to understand and talk about today is the kind that makes you know when you just hear something out of the blue, not from the voice, but just from listening to the music, you know who, who made it. Uh, I, know, I know that this is, you know, I can listen to six seconds of it and I know this is Radiohead, for example. Or, you know- Even I, if you took out the, the voice. Yeah, we don't um, have to hear the whining to know. <laughs> Um, okay, the whining. Of, yeah. <laughs> if you took out like Janet Jackson, right? You take out Janet Jackson's voice and you play some unknown track. Could you tell that it was produced by Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis? I bet you could. I bet you could. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, or, and or, that's or, an interesting or, or, point. Or, producers are really who's create. You know, composers create the identity, and you know, Western classical music producers are really who's creating the identity. I would say. Um, and it's funny that the entirety of the LA structure, the, the label, the major label structure is designed to talk about the artist, right? It's all about the artist. Yeah. Um, and that means the singer who probably had, in most cases, actually very little to do with the creation of anything except what came out of their mouth in the mic that one time, which was then totally changed um, after the fact. At this point in, in modern music making, that's that's how it works. So the producers are creating that identity. So can you hear a bit and tell it's Timbaland? And our favorite producers are people where the answer is yes. Yeah, I can tell it's Timbaland. And again, not just because he's, you know, kind of shouting in the background, which he's want to do, but because he has a way of making beats that's very identifiable. Um, and how to codify that, that's the type of identity that we're talking about. And that is hard and, and it's cool. essential. It's essential because that has in my my estimation, more of a cultural impact long term than Carrie, Katy Perry's uh, five or six albums. You know, that's a very different kind of business exchange. But a Timbaland uh, groove is going to have an impact to so many artists for so long. Culturally, it's going to have, it's going to mean some things. It's going to be very important. And, and the AI machines are going to pick that up and they're going to start cloning that in some way. Well, and, and we need to understand. And, it, and what's happening with LLMs as they're, as they're feeding themselves back their own creation, what's been found is that, you know, if, if an LLM is trained on LLM-generated material, it gets worse and worse and worse. It's not good. It, it only is working when it's trained on human-created material. And so I think that, you know, as music systems, AI systems get better, I think you will find that as well, unless unless you can teach a computer to understand all of these things about creating music that, that humans intuitively and have understood, you know, just by listening and, and very talented and hardworking humans have figured out how to understand it and make it right. And so, uh, you know, I think, I think it's worth noting that you can't just expect a computer to learn to produce great music Unless great music is still being made to teach it. Um, well, and that brings us to a whole other potential podcast discussion, which is that of the, um, the, the process of evolution in music invention. Mm. So can you take what would be Darwinian evolution, apply it over many, 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 many iterations to find mutations that are 
uh, that are going to be satisfying? And could that produce a creative machine? Am I talking to Richard Dawkins right now? Is that maybe you're talking about like the the Dawkins style meme, the idea meme? Absolutely. Yeah. The meme. Yes. Yeah. The idea that a meme will live through. It does live through. Uh, it, it, so an artist can create it whether they know about the past or not, and they it can be injected into the system. And if it takes off, and it has to, there, I'm writing an article about this. It's coming out soon. But um, if it if it has exposure and it can can grab hold. Uh, it can have an influence and grow and become part of the, you know, part of the fabric, just like a just like a, an evolution, a biological evolutionary process. There's it, there's a lot of similarities there. And in music, in order for an idea to be powerful like that, I think uh, it has to have a strong, clear, and pleasant somehow or desired identity. Right. That's what. That's what actually. Yeah. I guess that's. That's how we're really, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road with with musical identity. It's, does it live on? Does it influence others, right? Does it well inject said. itself into the into the musical stream of of production? Um, yeah, and that is there are absolutely... things that have to. There are things you can't do that inside a machine. This is key. You can't just have it iterate inside the machine and decide this is the evolution because you haven't given it the test of it, has, it hasn't had a chance to go out and live. These mutations haven't had a chance to go out and try their try their luck or whatever. See so how they. You're grab saying an audience. if unless we can codify what makes musical identity successful in that way. So you're saying if we can do that, if we can codify mm -hmm. this is what makes musical identity successful, it has held true over this long period of time across cultures, you know, these are these are what make it work. These are the things that we can define. If you can define that to a point, to a fine enough point that you can teach a computer what that means, you're saying then that's when a computer can create its own musical, its own ideas with it, their own musical identity. Is that because it has to? Yes, that's right. It has to judge. It has to judge with the way in a way that we we would, and I say we collectively, not individuals, but the way we would as a group. And that leads leads you to the to the search for universals, if there are some, or universal concepts. Which is another podcast topic, but uh, yeah. So, um, yes, you, you nailed it. All yes. right. I believe you could. I believe you could create real computational creativity in that way. Hmm. Well, let's leave it at that for today. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. This is obviously one of our absolute favorite topics. You will hear us continue to talk about identity uh, forever if you're willing to listen. Um, but for today. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and thank you. Yeah, we hope to hear from you. We hope to see you. Um, please feel free to, to write us if you have questions or just want to chat or you have ideas for topics that you'd like to hear us cover. And um, other than that, we're going to see you soon. Have a great day. Be well. Be well.